Hi, I'm Maddie. Welcome to the Faith Community YouTube channel. We'd love to know where you're joining from in the comments. And hey, take a moment to share this message with a friend and then hit the red subscribe button. Also, if you'd like to learn more about getting connected at Faith Community, stick around at the end of the video for more details. We hope this message encourages you to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. But today, what I want to do is, it's been... It's been a minute since I preached, and uh, I heard from, you know, most people are like, we, we just needed a break from you, Josh, so thank you for, for taking a break, and I needed a break from you, too, so it, was just, it just worked out really well, but uh, Pastor Brian and Tabitha, I know, did a great job while I was gone, and uh, yeah, you can clap, um, and really, it was kind of their idea to start talking about some verses in the scriptures that maybe don't mean what we think they mean uh, in that kind of way, and I had every intention of continuing that, but a lot of times what happens is when I go on one of these mission trips, I just come back with something on my heart, and so that's what I wanted to do today, is just share something uh, that I've been going through, and that I've been kind of coming to terms with the fact that I've been going through, and just to to share it with you today. So if you're looking for a three-point sermon and a big, huge takeaway to walk out of here with a recipe for success in an area, I'm going to have to let you down. That's not going to happen today. I'm not fully out of the woods, but I'm, I'm getting close to being out of the woods here, and God has been teaching me some things and revealing some things to me. You know, about uh, when 2020 hit at the beginning, none of us had any idea of what would happen. Absolutely not. It was 2020 vision, wasn't it? God was going to make things crystal clear. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, what better word from God than 2020 could you get? I mean, it just made sense, right, to see things clearly. And uh, I, we had begun the process of, of changing some things, and there were some difficult things that I had, Lauren and I had been going through that happened at the beginning of that year, and then COVID hit, and it was just, you know, uh, breakneck speed to have to learn and make decisions of which you probably, you know, nobody was really educated for. And as I've mentioned before, there was no class in college about how to handle all of these things going on and what church looks like through that. But part, what I didn't realize is, so this is two and a half years now, part of my journey was, uh, I, I mentioned, I guess, three weeks ago when I preached on Habakkuk that the Lord let me know that I was angry with him, and I had to realize that I was. Not only was I angry, but I've come to realize that uh, I, I didn't really, I was starting to not trust God. You know, I don't know if you've ever been there. God's saying, trust me. It's like, I don't know, Lord, because you made me go through some things that I do not appreciate. Matter of fact, I think you could have circumvented the whole process and fixed those things and not had me to go through them. I don't know how I feel about you leading me through the valley of the shadow of death. I I read Psalm 23, preached it, but wasn't ready to live it, if you know what I mean. I found myself frustrated. What I was doing is in the beginning of the, the, everything going on, I, just, I, I didn't realize this then, but just started making decisions and not, not praying a whole lot. You know, it's like, well, God, I think this is going to work. And I've been doing this, you know, for like five years now. So <laughs> six, whatever. And I, I think this is going to work. So God, here's my plan. Why don't you bless it? And everything will be good. Is that anybody's prayer life sometimes? God, here's the issue. Here's my plan. I prayed about it. Didn't hear anything, didn't hear a no, so a no, a lack of a no must be a yes, right? So just go. Started making decisions, and, and things, you know, they, they kind of worked, and we, we made our way through uh, the, the pandemic and all the other kind of things to somewhat of a, a successful degree, and, and amazingly, you all became incredibly more generous, and, and more finances came in, and I was like, look at, look at how amazing I am, you know what I mean? Look at, yeah, wow, you know, Lord, you, you just must be super proud of me and, uh, and happy with me. I'm not even having to talk to you as much. We must be on the same page, right? It's just right here, you know, direct connection. We got Wi-Fi going on where it's just this download. And what I realized, though, started with my journey for, through, through counseling, but really the last probably month or so is when, uh, or month and a half, I don't, my timeline's kind of messed up, is when I, I really started to be aware of some things that I just, I was just tired and I was frustrated and I wasn't happy and, and I, I, I didn't know what was going on. And I was sitting over here three weeks ago when, when Pastor Mark preached and one of our elders was sitting on that side of the church. And afterwards, she came up to me and she said, Josh, and I said, yeah, she goes, are you okay? And my first response inside was, oh, yeah, I'm doing great. How are you doing? It's what we say at church, right? How are you doing? I'm wonderful. You know, it's amazing. And I said, no, I'm just tired. Just tired. She said, I could see it on your face from across the 
fighting. And she goes, are you, are you okay? I said, I think I'm okay. I'm not physically tired. I'm just emotionally tired. I'm, I'm, I'm psychologically tired. I'm just, I'm just spiritually, I'm just tired. It's tired. I went home that day and I had to go get something. So I was driving and I found myself just complaining to the Lord. I, I'll be honest. I found myself feeling sorry for myself. Can I tell you how enjoyable that is? Has anybody felt sorry for themselves? Anybody like it? Oh, I like it. I feel, I, sometimes I just feel so justified and I feel so right. I, I've never had as much clarity of thought as when I'm feeling sorry for myself in the world. And I was telling the Lord, so I, everything I say today, I want you to hear it in a raw way and I'm not gonna do any of these things, okay? I just want you to hear it. I was like, Lord, I'll tell you one thing. This whole church, this, this depends on me. Everybody needs me to do this. I got to be the rock for everything. I got to preach uh, not only good sermons, but it's got to be better than next week because you're bringing your friend. And uh, it's got this and, and all of this and people this. And I was complaining. I finally said, God, I feel like I got to do all this for everybody. Who in the world is there for me? That's what I said in, that's what I said in the car. And I just felt like the Lord said, I, I am. Mm. Yeah. I realized, I started to reflect from that moment. There's one thing that I stopped doing in the past two and a half years on a consistent basis is really giving God an opportunity to speak to me. I stopped speaking to him. I just figured because everything was going well, then he was good. Him and I were good. We could just have this kind of relationship where I don't talk to you, you don't talk to me, and we're okay. Except when I need something. Now, I wasn't consciously thinking I was the man. I wasn't looking in the mirror saying, you know, I am just the best ever. But my actions were, I wasn't spending time with God. I was getting up, sleeping to the very last moment, getting up, running out the door, getting on my, on my way, doing my thing, just putting my head down. I put my head down in the last two and a half years and just said, let's go. Because that's what needed to be done. And I don't quit. And I don't rarely ask for help. I rarely ask for help. Right? And that's what I realized. And I, the Lord led me to, to Psalm 73, Asaph wrote this psalm. Asaph was a Levite. He was a director of, of the music and things like that. And he's writing in Psalm 73 and he's complaining about how the, the, the injustice in the world and how the wicked prosper and all this kind of stuff. He's levying all these complaints. And then he gets to a point in Psalm 73 and he says, I decided to go to the tabernacle to the house of the Lord. I got so frustrated I decided to pray. Kind of thing. That's kind of why I was like, yes, Asaph, I agree with you. And then he says this, he said a part that wrecked me. He said, I went to the house of the Lord and then I realized that my heart was bitter. And I said, whoa, yeah, I'm still agreeing with you there, bro. My heart is bitter. And then he gets to probably the most famous line in Psalm 73. My heart and flesh will fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And I was like, I've been reading this Psalm 73 every day. I've been praying through Psalm 73. But my heart and flesh will fail. Every part of who I am, every part of self-reliance, every part of, of my own ideas and, 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 and lifting up my own thoughts and ideas and opinions to a place that is not appropriate above the thoughts and opinions and ideas of God or maybe to, the, to the, a level that is equal with his. Yeah, I know, I, I, I preached from Habakkuk and he was willing to go up to a high place and be corrected. I wasn't willing to be corrected. I was looking to be validated in my thought and my opinion. And there's a big difference. Levying something against the Lord and waiting for him to validate it or approve it when often maybe he wants to correct it. And that realization of this, here's what I realized. It's not if my heart and flesh fail. It's not when my heart and flesh fail. It's a must that our hearts and flesh fail. And that heart and flesh is just every part of who we are in our humanity, our strength, our opinions, our ideas, which in the, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, those things in and of themselves aren't wrong, but when the dependency is solely on ourself, and we have this thing called self-righteousness, right? we are not dependent upon God at all. I realize in order for God to be the strength of my heart, the rock is what that means, the mountain is what that means, is, is that my heart and flesh have to fail. It's a must that they fail and then become rooted and founded upon God. And it's really amazing that Asaph would say this. He was a Levite, and what that means from the tribe of Levi. And when they divided up the promised land, the tribe of Levi did not get any land. And they said, you are the priests, the pastors, so God is your inheritance. 
So Asaph is saying this, saying, I don't have any physical inheritance right now. God is my portion or my inheritance forever. Effectively saying, God, you are enough. You are more than enough. He says, who have I have in heaven or under heaven but you? I've got you. I think what I was effectively telling God is that you are not enough. But I was realizing as I'm saying, God, you are not enough. What I'm realizing is, no, I am not enough. And I'm becoming increasingly aware that I am not enough. Now, I know what culture says. I mean, I know we've had, we've had um, conferences where the main thing of the concert, conference was you are enough. No, you are not. I know what it means. What does it mean? God is enough. And I'm not saying that we aren't valuable. I'm not saying that we aren't made to have a contribution, that we weren't made in God's image. But if we are enough in and of ourselves, we have no need for him. Absolutely none. So I am not enough. I can't tell you how fun of a journey this has been. (laughs) And that the title of the message today, when God gives you a limp, somebody asked me, Joshua, just a couple weeks ago, a number of weeks ago, where do you feel like you're at with the Lord? Sometimes I hate that question. I don't know. I'll tell you, I had an answer. I said, I feel like I'm Jacob and that God is giving me my limp. And God gives you a limp. Genesis chapter 32, we find a familiar story to some, maybe not to all, when Jacob wrestles with God in the night and God gives him a limp. That is where I've kind of been living and recognizing that God is giving me my limp right now. Now, I, I recognize that as we're, I say, as we are saying this, as I'm saying this, and you're choosing to agree or not, that sometimes talking about God giving us a limp and wrestling with him, maybe not sometimes, all the time, doesn't sound very exciting or appropriate. But I think it is far more common than we want to realize. And I would say this, I don't think it's if you wrestle God or when you wrestle God, I think you must wrestle with the Lord. You must. And we all do, whether we want to admit it or not. See, Jacob is an interesting character. His father was named Isaac, and Isaac's father was named Abraham. The Bible tells us that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how God reveals himself to Moses, as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God appeared to Abraham, whose name was Abram, uh, at the beginning, and he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to call you out. He named him Abraham. I'm going to do all these things for you, and, uh, and you, through, all, through you, all the world will be blessed. God speaks to Abraham to do that, and Abraham's like, I don't know, God, I'm 100 years old, and my wife's like 90, and you created us, and we, we don't work that way anymore, if you know what I'm saying, the Lord, God. God promised, and Abraham speaks to Sarah and, and tells him about the promise, and she laughs. Of course, she laughed when she heard the angel say it, and, and Sarah was like, well, you know, I think that what you should do is sleep with our maidservant, Hagar, which is kind of a cultural thing back then. And Abraham's like, yeah, sure, I think it's a good idea. My wife said so. <laughs> Why not? Got to get this plan of God into motion here, you know? And so he does it, and they have Ishmael. And then it creates tension, if you can imagine, between Sarah and Hagar. But they have Isaac. And then Isaac, he... He goes out on his own and God reveals himself to Isaac and says, I am the God of your father, Abraham, and all the things I told Abraham, I will do to you. And Isaac marries a woman named Rebecca. And him and Rebecca have two sons, Jacob and Esau. They've got a bit of family issues as well because apparently Jacob has his favorite, and, or excuse me, Isaac has his favorite, who is Esau, and Rebecca has her favorite, who's Isaac. And so there's this dysfunctional family thing going on here. They have Jacob. Now, there's a problem in this family line, as you see throughout Scripture. There's a, there's a trait or a, a, um, uh, what we would say is a, something that needs to be worked out that's passed down, a sin from the father. Abraham was a liar. Abraham lied to the king about uh, Sarah being his wife. Is this your wife? Oh, no, she's my sister. He was afraid. And technically, she was like a half-sister or something. I know. Old Testament's kind of interesting sometimes, right? <laughs> technically, he lies. He lies. And then Isaac does the same thing. He lies to, I think it's Abimelech, one of those kings about, Rebecca, no, 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 she's not my wife. He lies. The lies get progressively worse because now you have Jacob. Jacob's name means to deceive and to supplant. Jacob isn't just lying to the king about something. Jacob's willing to lie to his own father. And he lies about being Esau to steal the inheritance and the blessing from his 
from his father because Jacob was not the firstborn son. Esau was the firstborn son, and the, right, the firstborn son was the rightful son to receive the largest portion of the inheritance. And we know that Esau sold his birthright, all this kind of stuff. But Jacob's a liar, and he's a deceiver. The majority of Jacob's life is, is about trying to scheme and put things into place and protect himself. Jacob goes away, and God speaks to Jacob. Hey, I'm the God of your father, Isaac, and Abraham, and I will do all this. And Jacob has this amazing encounter with God. He sees, he sees the, a ladder coming down from heaven, and it's people going up and down it, and he names the place Bethel, which becomes the house of God. Bethel means house of God. Amazing thing. And he is blessed extremely. He's a wealthy man. He goes to work for his uncle Laban. He falls in love with Rachel, Laban's daughter. He says, I'll work for you for seven years if you give me, give me your daughter, Rachel. He says, yes, but Laban's a deceiver too. So now the deceiver is being deceived because on the wedding night, he winds up with Leah. Whoops. <laughs> and then he says, I want Rachel. And then he and he, Leah and Rachel are you know, married to the same man and Rachel can't have kids, but Leah can. And Leah's trying to have kids to get Jacob to love her. And it's this whole thing. And then you know, Rachel wants to have kids to prove of her worth. So she says, why don't you sleep with this maid servant and sleep with this maid servant? So Jacob ends up having kids by four different women all into the same household. Pretty crazy. Where we find Jacob now, I just want to give you a little backstory. Jacob, chapter 32, is ready to face Esau again. He hasn't seen Esau since he deceived him. He's afraid for his life. He's really, I believe, that he thinks that Esau will kill him because of what happened. He finds himself at a place by the river Jabbok. And he is, he's in the next day, he's going to meet Esau. He sent all of his family and all of his possessions ahead, and he's the only one there on this side of the river. And he's got this whole plan worked out that he's going to send Esau, like, here's a gift. And if you don't like this gift, here's a second gift. That's not enough. Here's a third. If that's not enough, here's a fourth. He's got it all set up to, to scheme and make sure that he's okay. The, the one who's scheming and deceiving and trying to work everything out. It's while he's at the river that it says that he wrestles with God. This is what I want to read because this is where I think I feel like I've been. It said, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, there's the four women, and his 11 sons and crossed the, over the ford of the river, oh, of the Jabbok. So he sent all of his family. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man, capital M, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he, this is talking about God, touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. This is God said, let me go. And, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And then God says to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, well, tell me your name, I pray. And God said, why is it that you asked me about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. So most commentators believe that even though it doesn't say God, that this is the kind of pre-incarnate Jesus, or God himself, that wrestles with Jacob at night. A, a, an interesting story, definitely not the, the norm, but outside of the norm. He wrestles with him, and Jacob is all alone on this side of the river. I think, this is me personally, all the deceiving, all of the scheming is coming to a head in this moment, and he and God are going to have a moment. God is going to wrestle. question is, is who's going to prevail? Who's going to prevail? So Jacob is wrestling with the Lord, and it's interesting because it mentions the river by name. Why do we need to know that? Well, all we need to know is he's by a river, but the river named Jabbok literally means this. It means emptying. It's a tributary. It empties into a larger river, but I believe that every detail is there for a purpose, is that there is going to be, if Jacob will participate, an emptying of himself by wrestling with God. Jacob needs to lose something in order for God to be Lord of his life. He needs to lose something. It's fascinating that as he's wrestling with God, God asks him a question. What is your name? As if he doesn't know. One thing I've discovered, God never asks a question for his benefit. 
God never asks a question that he doesn't know to know the answer to. God asks questions for the person in the story. The question is going to be for them, and the question is for us too. Jacob, what is your name? And it can't be lost on us because the last time Jacob was asked his name, it was by Isaac, and he lied. I am Esau. You don't feel like Esau. You don't smell like Esau. No, no, I am Esau. He was willing to steal from his brother and deceive his own father for his own personal gain. I think the question is a profound question for Jacob. Jacob, who are you? Now's the time to be honest. Now's the time to be real. Because if you will not own up to who you are right now, who knows what the course of your life may be. And he is honest with the Lord. And he says, I am Jacob. I am a deceiver. I am a supplanter. And this is where God changes his name. No, no, no. Jacob, this is no longer who you are. You will be called Israel. Now, there's, there's debate over what Israel means. Some people will say it means prince of God. Some people say that it means God rules. And it can mean those things. But I tend to think that the idea of that, that God rules, that he changes Jacob's name to say, Jacob, you are no longer the one in charge. You are no longer the one that is, is scheming and putting and deceiving, putting all these things together. I am the one who rules. G. Campbell Morgan was a, was a great thinker and, and believer, and he said this, is that really we could say that Israel means not just God rules, but God mastered man. A God hyphen, a God mastered man. That God conquered Jacob in that moment. That God won out. And, and, and I just so relate to Jacob because I feel like I've been wrestling with the Lord and I've been, you know, trying to, to make him do what I want him to do. But yet he's willing to let me go through a process and do my own thing until I come to the end of myself and I admit I can't win. Now, we can do things our own way. We can make our own way. And we can be successful in the standards of our culture, we can be successful doing it our own way, but what I've discovered with a little bit of success that I've found is this, is that being successful in your own way and taking all the credit for it is exhausting because you really start to believe all of it depends on you. I didn't know I believed this, but I really did believe that this whole church was successful uh, and, and working because of me. How ridiculous is that? Right, And I'm not praying to God. I'm telling God. I'm treating like he's a, an employee. Do this, do this, do this. Bless this message. Give us this money for this. Get this person out of here. Bring this person in here. You know, All these things where, where God will, was just letting me do it. And I heard a pastor, a wise pastor say this a couple, back in April. He said, I've discovered that if the devil can't slow me down, he will get behind me and push me as fast as he can. I didn't realize the breakneck speed. I just had my head down and I was going. And it culminated for me in this wrestling with God. I find it interesting that, that Jacob says, I won't let go until you bless me. What does he want blessed? He's already rich. He's already got four baby mamas. He's already, I mean, like he's got the family. He's got everything. He knows he's going to go face Esau. Maybe that's what he's praying for. I don't know. What is the blessing that he wants? I want to be blessed. And it's like back, hearkening back to what he did with his father. I want the birthright because I believe it's mine. God blesses him, but in a very interesting way. This is my take on the blessing. The blessing was the limp. It wasn't money. It wasn't addition. It wasn't exponential. It wasn't multiplication. The blessing was the removal of something. I don't know about you, but when I pray for blessing, it is an addition. It is more and more and more. How many times have we preached that? It's more. But maybe what we need to see here in the story is that sometimes when God blesses, he takes things away. And it, it does create a space in us that he will fill with himself. We will get more, but we will only get more if we allow him to take things from us. He touched Jacob's hip. It's interesting because it says that when the man, God, found that he was going to be overtaken. I, I don't know. Is that poetic? Is that true? Was Jacob really going to out-wrestle God? 
Or was Jacob starting to think he was going to be, I'm not going to beat this guy. And all God had to do was, boop. And then it says at the end of the passage that Jacob limped his way out, that maybe for the rest of his life, Jacob walked with a limp as a reminder of the blessing of God that says, Jacob, it's, it's not all about you, man. I am the God of your father and your grandfather. I am the one who blessed you at Bethel. I am the one who blessed you under Laban when you worked for him. I am the one who have brought you to this place. I am the one who will bring you across the river Jabbok. I am the one who will restore the relationship between you and Esau. It is not you, Jacob. It is me. What's interesting, too, is right after that, he names him Israel, but he continues to call him Jacob. The narrative does. Matter of fact, Throughout the rest of the biblical narrative, he will be called Jacob twice as many times as he will be called Israel. Because I think whatever God removes from us and whatever process that we're in, it works itself out over time. Read chapter 33. You're going to see Jacob didn't change instantaneously. He still schemed. But what's not lost on me is this, is that when you read further into the book of Genesis, Revelation, I'm skipping way ahead. Genesis... (laughs) He reveals himself to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not Israel. Why didn't he say, I am the God of Abraham? Because he didn't say he was the God of Abram. Abraham, the name he gave him. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, God saw that he was Israel. But it's a process of God ruling and conquering and mastering us. Jacob's heart and flesh had to fail. My question is, what if the blessing of the Lord is a limp? And that limp is a continual reminder of what we are dependent on him, no matter how successful we may become according to the world's standards. No matter how much you have, no matter how much you don't have, what if we could pray for a limp? I know, it doesn't sound fun. But it's in the limp where we recognize that God is with me and he's never left me nor forsaken me. I'm going to tell you the point that I got to in doing this all on my own. Let me preface it. I'm not going to do this. So what I'm going to say, I'm not going to do this. I want you to hear it. I told the Lord just, just about a month and a half ago. I said, Lord, I'm 37 and a half. I still count half birthdays. It's fun. <laughs> I said, 37 and a half. I'll give you two more years. I'm 40. And I'm out. I'm done. You got two years to figure yourself out, Lord. Only reason... Only reason I'm passing this church because you called me. Because you told me to. And now I'm tired. I'm sick of it. I'm giving you two more years. 40 seemed to be good for me. First third of my life, you know, whatever. That's where I was at. I'm going to give two years, Lord. Realized I was bargaining with God. Can I tell you, when you bargain with the Lord, it may be an indication you're not in the right spot where you need to be. But it's incredibly human. Have you ever bargained with the Lord? God, I'm going to give you this. If you don't do this, I'm out. I was fantasizing about creating callings for myself and submitting them to the Lord to see if he would answer them. God, I speak Spanish, bro. I'm in House Springs. There's nobody that speaks Spanish here. I paid for that degree, Lord. Come on, give me an ROI on my investment, bro. I could have went somewhere else and not paid as much... (laughs) All these things. And we're sitting in Guatemala and we're listening to Bill Vasey, who was the missionary that went there in 1968. He was down there with us. He's 80 years old now. Still stronger and walking up mountains faster than I can. And he was sharing that when he was a young man, he made a commitment to the Lord. And he said, I spent over roughly 40 years of my life in Guatemala serving the Lord 60 plus years. And he said, I'll tell you the, the main thing that I've done is I just, like George said, I said yes to the Lord. I, I endeavored to be obedient. Even when he asked me to do things that I didn't want to do, that I didn't like, I've been obedient. What I heard him say is, I've wrestled with the Lord over and over, and every time, he wins. But we have a choice. We have a choice. That's what I've learned, and I'm learning. I've got a choice. So you will wrestle with the Lord. Maybe you are wrestling with the Lord. All I know is this. I'm starting to embrace the limp a lot more. 
Because, because you have to understand, I never wanted to be seen as weak. I never wanted to be seen as if I didn't know how to do something. I really don't want to be seen as stupid. That's a great fear that I have. To the point that I realized that I had taken such an intellectual path with God. I was like, I'm going to outlearn you, Lord. I'm going to learn about the word and all these things to try to undo. I mean, I was just like, give me knowledge, give me knowledge. And the Lord was like, I'm not going to give you any more knowledge right now. I'm going to give you my presence and a a revelation of who I am. I will be with you, with you. So I'm trying to embrace that limp. So if there's one thing that I could offer you today that is a possible maybe way forward in the journey, I'll just tell you what I've been doing the past couple weeks. It's not profound. It's not anything that you've never heard before. And it may sound incredibly simple, but here's the only thing that I've done that has produced a pretty profound change. I'll give you two things, all right? If I was a real preacher, I'd give you three, but I'm going to give you two. <laughs> the first is this, is I just got honest before the Lord. I got raw as he revealed that. Like, like Asaph said, I realized my heart was bitter. I had to realize that my heart was bitter. I had to acknowledge that. That, God, I don't like you right now. God, I don't like this. I think it's stupid. I think I got way better ideas. I know I could be more effective. All this stuff, I got honest. And the second thing is, is this. Here's the not super profound. I just started giving them 15 minutes in the morning. Oh, maybe I just get up and just I pray and I read the scripture and I just sit there and drink my coffee and I give him opportunity to speak. Say, no, God, I give you, I give you this day. And Lord, I, I give you this church. This is yours. It's not mine. It's always been yours. I can tell you this. I, I, it was way easy to trust God in the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing. All I had was Jesus. Then I got a little wisdom, a little experience, a little success, a little more money in the church bank account. And it was like, <laughs> trusting God's pretty easy. No, no, no. I need to trust him more now. I need him more now. I didn't realize that. And it wasn't conscious. It was little by little. So if anything, all I have to offer today is just give God some time. And maybe your prayer is like we sang. It's Jesus. I just want to speak Jesus over this and over that and, and everything. And he'll give you his limp. So I, I don't know what my limp will be. But all I know is he's, give, he's given me one right now. And it's good. And in the past three weeks, I feel a whole lot better than I did the past couple years. And I wasn't even aware. And I just figured if I go through it, I hope you all go through it too. Uh, just to make me feel better. I mean, I don't hope. Like, I hope for you. I just don't want to be alone. You know what I mean? But, well, here's what I want to do. I, I want to close in prayer. I'd ask for you to stand. I want to pray over each and every one of you here and, and online. Just pray that you'd meet the Lord wherever. He would meet you wherever you're at. So if you'd bow your heads. First question I would ask is if there's anybody here online, you'd say, you know what? I've been wrestling with God, not from a place of just knowing him, but just I feel like he's drawing me to himself. And I'd call that a place of decision to be a Jesus follower or a Christ follower, to give yourself to him completely and let him fill your life. I want to pray for you here in a moment if you want to give your life to Jesus. And the second group I want to pray for is just those people saying, I'm wrestling with God, or I've wrestled with God, or I'm at the point of that river, like he's emptying me. And my encouragement is this, that whatever he takes away, he will fill you with even more of himself, and it will be better. What you have to let go of will pale in comparison to what he gives you in place of. But Heavenly Father, I just pray right now, anybody that says, you know what, I'm making a decision, I want to follow Jesus, I pray that, Lord, their prayer would be like this, that, dear Jesus... Take all of my sin and my brokenness and my shame. I lay it all down at your feet and and I receive the, the salvation and the righteousness and the life that you give. And I choose to declare in this moment that you are the Lord and the Savior of my life and that I'm a new creation and that you will continue to heal me and deliver me and set me free for the rest of my life. Father, I pray for any individual in here that's maybe struggling in the same way. Maybe they're not. But Lord, I pray that they would have uh, the understanding of just like that, that, that young woman in Guatemala, that God, you saw her and you heard her prayer and you answered it. That Father, you hear us, you see us, and you know us, and you answer our prayers. 
May you give us the eyes to see your response, the ears to hear, and the heart and the mind to perceive what it is that you're doing. And even if your answer is something we didn't anticipate or we don't want, may we embrace it because, God, you don't always give us what we want. You give us what we need, and we are in the process of learning to want what you want. Help us to want what you want, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would give us a limp that's so profound that it could only bring glory to your name. And that, as Paul prayed, we pray it too, that, Father, you would do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that we could ask for or imagine according to the power that's at work within us, and that is Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us today. We're always seeing new faces, and we would love the opportunity to meet you. Text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will be in touch to answer any questions you have about faith community. And if you made the decision to follow Jesus today, text that same word, NEW TO FAITH to 97000. Our team would love to celebrate with you and get some resources to you. We also want to stay in touch on social media. We're there throughout the week posting content we believe will encourage you and help you move from where you are to where God wants you to be. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as YouTube. And speaking of that, if you're joining on YouTube, make sure you hit that red subscribe button and the bell icon so you're the first to know when new content is available. And finally, we know life can be challenging no matter where you're at on the journey, and we would love to come alongside you in prayer. Let us know if we can pray for you by sending us an email or on the app. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time.